Welcome to Archaeology Books for Fun, a podcast where we discuss books that are about archaeology but anyone can enjoy. I'm your host, Tristan Harenstein, and with me as ever is my co-host, Barbara Clark. Hello, everybody. If you're listening to this as a podcast, please give us a rating and a review. If you're listening to this as video, please like, subscribe, comment, whatever is appropriate for your platform. That really helps us, gives us some feedback, and helps get the word out there. So today we're jumping into a new book. We finished up our previous one, and we're starting with In Small Things Forgotten, An Archaeology of Early American Life by James Dietz. So this was a book that Barbara and I both read back in our undergraduate days, and it was kind of an introduction to historical archaeology and archaeology in general to some degree. But it's also, it's old enough that it does need a little bit of historical context so you understand kind of where the book is coming from when it was written. Originally, it was written in 1977, and the version I have at least was edited in 1996. Yeah, that's the version I have as well. And so the updates, uh, I'm not clear on exactly where all the updates are. But there is a nice little, well, they call it introduction, but it's really kind of a foreword from the author about the updates. In particular, he was updating some terminology specifically relating to African Americans. So he clarified that they have used the term African American and African when they knew the term, how the term applied. It was based on where the individual was born. I don't know that that's necessarily the best way of handling it, but it is a kind of a difficult space to navigate when you're dealing with that. And uh, I appreciate that he's trying, especially in, you know, 1995. Yeah, I, this is something that I've struggled with when giving tours of cemeteries that were segregated, especially early ones where the people buried in the black portion or African-American portion, you know, were they really African-American because they were slaves? Right. So this is a issue even still today, I think. So the book originally was written in a time when archaeology was undergoing a pretty big transition. It's kind of when archaeology kind of became a science. The way it kind of developed was you had very early stuff, which was basically rich people going around and collecting things from other cultures and putting it in their houses to display. Eventually, people started to figure out, oh, we can actually learn things from all this, these bits of pottery and stuff, all the broken pieces even. So there was a lot of focus on just kind of cataloging everything and a lot of focus on chronology. And that was kind of where it stopped. They didn't really have much concept that they could learn stuff from it. I think there was kind of a concept that if we collect enough stuff, it's all going to make sense at some point. Yeah, I would agree with that. And yeah, there was such a such a focus on chronology, which is good. And one of the questions you and I get most often is how old is something? Right. But really, archaeology is so much more than that. That's it's, such a small part of it. It's kind of the least interesting question you can ask about a site or an artifact even, really. Yep. In my opinion. I agree. But it was necessary. It was a necessary first step for figuring this out because they needed that data to be able to pull from when they start to develop the next step, which is where we're at now. And this is called the processualist movement. Essentially, like I said, This is basically they figured out, oh, we can actually use statistics and scientific methods and we can learn a whole lot more than we realized. And reading this now, uh, again, with everything I've known for the past 20, 30 years, it's kind of mind boggling that this was ever a debatable issue. I kind of grappled with that as well. Uh, (laughs) Like you had mentioned, we haven't read this book in maybe 20 years Mm -hmm. and it just... That kind of made it fun for me because 20 years ago, I hadn't really done much archaeology. I didn't have much practical experience. And so to read it again with the practical experience that I have under my belt is just kind of fun. Well, and some of the subjects he covers in this book still weren't fully resolved even in the early 2000s, I don't think. I remember having debates in classes about, is historic archaeology handmade into history? That kind of thing. And it wasn't fully resolved. Now it's kind of laughable that that was ever a concern. Oh, yeah. I had people tell me I was cheating by studying historical archaeology because we had documents and prehistoric archaeologists don't have documents. So their archaeology is more valuable. (laughs) And I I want to take a step back real quick to clarify uh, what we mean by prehistoric and historic as well. I've heard there is some debate over whether or not these terms are appropriate implying that people before Europeans didn't have a history. And that is actually not how we are using this term. For us, it simply means you have records to use or you don't have records to use. And I believe he discusses that a little bit 
I believe in chapter one. Yeah, but not the not the uh, the current implications currently. True. True. And we're kind of keeping an eye on that debate. Essentially, I'm open to changing the terminology I use, but I haven't heard any alternative suggestions on how we classify this yet. So uh, just kind of be aware that could be changing. And in the future, this may be very much out of date. We're aware that that could be coming. And so this book not only was really critical in developing or establishing archaeology as a science or a social science or putting forth that it needs to, we need to be using scientific methods in our research, it was also really important for establishing that historic archaeology was important, that it was its own thing. The archaeology in the before this, and still I'd say a lot of archaeology today is dominated by what we would, in the U.S., would refer to as prehistoric archaeology. So again, there are no records to draw from for that. That is a huge part of the North American past. And I will say I've heard some people refer to um, prehistoric archaeology as pre-contact. Yeah. So that's another potential term to use. I guess they're kind of interchangeable. There is not a like a cut line for when it becomes historic archaeology, when it means prehistoric archaeology. Um, there are some Native American groups that had some level of documentation, at least. We're still kind of working out how much. And then, you know, instant you know, European contact doesn't instantly make it historic archaeology either. You know, so it's still not as cut and dry as the division makes it sound, for sure. It's like people are complicated people or People are complicated. The past is complicated. Another reason this was actually a, a very important book was because it was very accessible. And I've noticed hints of kind of the time when we're reading this, and we'll get to that, I'm sure. But this was from a time where I literally have had a professor tell me that he was told when he was a student in this era that it's not good theory if it's easy to understand. So essentially this idea that if you aren't making your stuff impenetrable to people who aren't trained in it, you're not doing good work. It's kind of that ivory tower almost mentality that thankfully I think we're largely moving past. I sure hope so. Yeah, it was no fun. Reading from this era was a chore most of the time. Oh, yeah. Even as a student who studies archaeology, I remember reading certain books that were written in that time period and just being mind boggled, not understanding it. And it's very discouraging when you're trying to get a degree in that so that you can have a career in that. Right. Yeah. And when we talk about how much we don't like theory in previous books, a lot of that comes from this era and the way they talked about theory. Yes, that's very, very true. Let's see. So by and large, uh, Barbara and I already know we like this book. It isn't above criticism, even especially if you put it in today's context, but even in its time, I did see uh, on the good old useful Wikipedia article, there was some talks about its criticisms about the book. There are some inaccuracies. There is suggestion that there's too much focus on the things and some of the details might have, you know, been missed. And it felt like he was, the criticism seemed to think that he was too broad in trying to encompass, make it work for everything when it may not have worked for everything. Although when I look at some of the examples given, I feel like it's people nitpicking for the purpose of nitpicking, essentially. I also feel like this book was written not necessarily for archaeologists. It was written about archaeology. In some ways, yeah. And so, I mean, this book isn't a very thick book, and it's very approachable. So I feel like you can't, like I said, humans are complicated. And yeah, there's going to be some generalizations made and things like that. But in order to give somebody an idea of what historical archaeology is and to provide them with a good, solid introduction, I think it does a pretty fair job. Yeah. And it feels like people, the book is about ideas and it's using examples to illustrate the idea. Whereas the criticisms I was seeing was picking at the examples and I didn't quite like that. And we'll get to this one today. Uh, they state that porcelain is quite unusual in archaeological sites before 1800. And apparently that's kind of over, I think it's a little too broad, is my guess. Another one is that it's criticized for being focused on New England archaeology. So that's the Northeast U.S. And the methods and theories presented may not be applicable to other locations and time periods, which I think is kind of ridiculous. Like, yes, the ceramics for example, may not exactly fit, but the overall ideas being presented, it can apply to practically anything. 
and it makes sense to kind of focus in on that area as well. That's where the colonies were. So that's really where you will get some of the earlier historic sites. In the U.S. Yeah. And that's his expertise. You know, right. you kind of got to go with where your expertise is at. And that's where a lot of this work at this point had been done. Now we know that it applies much broader than that, of course. But yeah. And I, I do want to add, uh, if anyone's thinking of reading along, it was just like a breath of fresh air. <laughs> It's such a pleasant read, I found. Would you agree with that, Barbara? I would. He's a really good writer, yeah. and it's a very enjoyable read. And I love the way that it starts off in chapter one. It just it makes me smile. Yeah, go ahead with that if you want. Sure, yeah. So he starts out with these... Um, vignettes? Vignettes. That's a perfect way to describe them. And each one is different. And it, you know, he talks about, of course, obviously, my favorite one was the cemetery. But different instances of how people may have lived and what activities they would have done. And as an archaeologist, I immediately start thinking about, ooh, what would this look like in the archaeological record? And each vignette is just so unique and so different. And he does a good job, and I will say, especially for it being from the 70s, in kind of diversifying the portfolio of vignettes that he presents. Yeah, I see that effort throughout the book. Yeah. Um, it doesn't always meet our standards today, but I can see where he's making those that effort to diversify that, especially in a new field. Start, only just starting to figure out that we can study other groups. We should be studying other groups. Uh, one thing that stuck out with me was the most recent vignette took place in 1932, which when the time this book was written was only 55 years earlier. And there's this kind of mentality in... Among archaeologists, that if you're not dealing with something really old, it's not worth your time. And 50 years is, for many, too young to consider interesting. So I thought it was interesting that he included that in his, just right off the bat. I also noticed his definition of archaeology, and it is, archaeology is the study of past peoples based on the things they left behind and the ways they left their imprint on the world. And I know Barbara's heard me say this, because I use almost that exact definition Yep. When I explain what archaeology is to people, especially kids. But I love the part about imprint on the world. Because yeah. no matter how, you know, common or insignificant a person from history may seem, they've left something behind for us to learn about them and about their way of life and the people that they were living with. And that's just kind of a cool thought. Yeah. And I got my definition, I know from someone in FPAN, and I'm betting they got theirs from this book. That would be my guess is how that's developed. So it kind of gives you maybe a sense of the impact this book has had, even in some smaller ways. He starts right out the gate to declaring historical archaeology as significant with a unique perspective to contribute. And like I said, even in the early 2000s, this was still sometimes a debate. So he's making a, a grand statement here in 1977 that this is important. And I, I like that he does that. I've always found it really strange to that. There were people that didn't think of historic archaeology as significant, especially in the United States, where mm -hmm. we pay so much focus to our colonial kind of beginnings. And archaeology is such a good way to study that. But for some reason, archaeology in the United States was always, or at least early on, not very open to considering historic archaeology as a way to kind of further that study and narrative. Just weird to me. Yeah, and I feel like sometimes it was a matter of getting things to kind of, where does it fit into things? Because on one hand, the way it's been used mostly at this point is to confirm or compare it to historic records. Yeah. I think sometimes, though, this is based off of a lack of understanding of some of the weaknesses of historic records. And as you've heard us talk about before, it's things like who wrote the histories, you know, and how many people throughout that history does that record represent? And it's very, very small number of people. And who wrote them and why they wrote them, who are they writing to, all these things are biases that are introduced in the original record and what gets written down and that kind of thing. And I do like how he touches on throughout the book the variety of records available to us. When people think of the written record, a lot of times they think of biographies and journals and things like that, but things like probate records and deed records and even, you know, arrest records, you know, all these things can provide us clues to the past. So I think he does a really good job of presenting, especially when he talks about like probate records and things like that. Those are very useful. He provides what he says is a common definition of historic archaeology, 
which is an archaeology of the spread of European cultures throughout the world since the 15th century and their impact and interaction with the cultures of indigenous people. And before you get your hackles up, <laughs> he has two problems with this, and we're going to have some more. One problem he has with it is, or two observations. First observation is it does imply that we need to take more of a global perspective with our archaeology. And he thinks more than prehistoric archaeology, although I think that's maybe we know now that's less true. Like our prehistoric archaeology needs to take more of a global perspective than we thought at this time as well. But he also notes that this fails to account for enslaved Africans or Asian immigrants, as well as post-European contact Native Americans. And so this is what I would talk about when he, I see him working towards a more inclusive archaeology, a more inclusive past. Now, now we would even take that further. Although I think it's important to also keep in mind when he talks about historic archaeology, and it seems like it's too narrow, he's almost certainly, I think, talking about New England historic archaeology. Probably, yeah. So this is a very uh, North America-centric book. No, no secret about that. That's his expertise. That's what he's talking about. That's where, like I said, at this point, a lot of the research has been done. But of course, we've already looked at Anchor, for example, and all the historic records, Pompeii, and all the historic records. That's historic archaeology, too. Although I don't know that other parts of the world have had the struggle we had to the significance of historic archaeology because it was so old already. And sometimes I think the line between what is historic and what is not is even harder to distinguish than it is in North America. Yeah, and I think it gets a little messier here just because of our history. Um, not that other places haven't had messy history, but slavery and Native Americans that were here before, uh, how do you kind of work all that in? It, mm -hmm. I think our history... When I've always thought of it as like nonlinear, although I don't know that that would make sense to other people because I know like in England and stuff, they have medieval archaeology, Iron Age archaeology, this, that, and the other. And we kind of have that, especially in prehistoric archaeology. People study the woodlands or Paleo-Indian, but then when you get to historic archaeology, it sometimes can get a little messy where people specialize in only battlefield archaeology of the Civil War era. And then, you know, somebody might study only landscape archaeology pertaining to historic gardens. You know, it's just, it's, it kind of changes focus almost. Then he moves into a discussion about how prehistoric archaeology and historic archaeology differ. And I thought this was kind of interesting. One difference he sees is that prehistoric archaeology is more focused on excavation. And I thought this was a little odd. I think more focused is probably fair, but I think a lot of historic archaeology is focused on excavation. It does make me wonder how historic archaeology has changed since then as far as excavation goes, because it's almost, I feel like, and I, I've heard this before, like historic archaeology is on the surface. Mm -hmm. And so you're not really excavating, you know, prehistoric archaeology. You're doing excavation. But I don't think... Yeah. It just seems like a very dated never, statement, maybe. Never worked on a historic archaeology site where we didn't do excavation, unless we're just doing a preliminary recording of things. Yeah, I can't. I was trying to think if I ever had either. And the only thing I can think of is he is including things like houses, That's... which today we would tend to relegate that to architectural historians. We wouldn't necessarily include that as historic archaeology for the house structure itself. Yeah, which I, I thought that was kind of interesting that he did that. And I don't know when that change occurred, but, you know, I have my master's from the University of Leicester in mm -hmm. England, and they do consider above ground structures to be archaeology, which is a little bit different than here. And I took classes in how to document these structures. But anybody you talk to that went to graduate school here in the United States, when it comes to historic houses, that's the architectural historian's kind of realm. So. I wonder if over time that's just kind of changed. Well, I think they're working out the definition at the point where this was originally written. 1995, I'm less certain, but, you know, maybe you only changed certain amounts. I don't know exactly what they changed even when they rewrote this. He does talk about how a lot of historic archaeology has been conserved in museums and that it's a potential resource, which, again, I thought was a little odd. I don't know anyone who's done a study of a museum's collection beyond, like, if they have like boxes of stuff they've worked through from a site, you know, as far as like what's on display, I don't know that anyone really studies that stuff usually. Because usually we need a large number of things to get much meaningful. And the handful of stuff that gets put on display is often not as useful for that. 
Yeah, and the stuff that gets put on display, and it de- obviously it depends on the type of interpretation you're seeing at a museum that varies greatly. Mm-hmm. But a lot, oftentimes, you know, they put the cool things, the unique things that pretty things, yeah, that may not necessarily re- represent everyday life and existence at that time period. It's the stuff that will catch people's attention. Mm-hmm. So, he does observe that that's usually those things are the things they're the wealthiest and prettiest things too, which is not necessarily representative of what everyone had or was able to have. Yeah. He does acknowledge, and I was kind of impressed by this, the potential for interviews with people uh, to aid your research in historic archaeology. That was actually pretty unique. Yeah, I found that interesting because I remember when I was doing cultural resource management in Florida, you know, that was what, 10, 10, 15 years ago. And getting interviews was something that I guess was not necessarily commonplace. And the compliance and review section was trying to encourage CRM firms to do more of that. It was my favorite part, like going and talking to the local historical society, going and talking to the local, you know, author who was writing about a specific character, or piece of property or time period in history. You learned so much. And they were always just so fun to talk to. And he does talk about how you should get it from multiple people because memory can be fallible. Although I know we've there's been studies since then, as in like the last few years even, that find that there is such a thing as kind of group memory. And it's just as, if not maybe even a little more fallible than individual. For example, we have a colleague who did an excavation in a cemetery local here in Florida. And there's a, a legend that these certain stones marked a mass grave of Union soldiers from the Civil War. And so she was basically testing that local memory and found there was nothing there. So memory is, it has its own biases, essentially. It is still an incredibly useful resource. But like any other resource we use, including archaeology, we have to be aware of where these biases are and try to account for them. I also liked his talk about photography as a uh, resource available to us that prehistorians, of course, don't have. I really liked this new amazing technology he described where you take an old historic photograph and put it on a transparency transfer that to a slide and slot it in front of a camera so you can see exactly where the image took place i made a note of that too uh, <laughs> we've that's come so far fantastic <laughs> i also noted and he didn't note this you could also see exactly where the photo was taken from which Seems like that may not be as important as the event the photograph is of, but I think it probably could be a very useful thing for a lot of reasons. I just thought it was interesting because not too long ago, I went to a lecture on historic hotels in Tallahassee, and a lot of them have since been demolished. A lot of them, for some reason whatsoever, I don't know, burned in a fire. A lot of them burned in fires in Tallahassee. But the presenter who was just local historian for the PowerPoint, he was placing maps on top of old photographs and things like that. And it's just funny that this was such a novel idea. And now you have, you know, a local amateur historian who does it just because he wants to do his own research and see where things are. So we have come so far. And that's that's low tech now. Yeah, I've, I've even done a little of some of this. I didn't do as far as he describes, but. During the Civil War in Pensacola, there was a Confederate officer who took photographs from the lighthouse that still stands. And so you can go up in that lighthouse and hold up the photographs and see exactly where the old hospital was that burned down and where the camps were and where the batteries were and all this detail that you wouldn't get easily anyway. Uh, Then he moves on to talk about some of the weaknesses in historic documents. And we've covered this already. Who writes it? You know, that kind of thing. And he highlights how the two, historic archaeology and history, complement each other. They fill in the weaknesses of the other one. Only certain things enter the archaeological record. History has certain biases, as in uh, what is written down and by whom. And so by combining the two, you come out with a stronger result. I also thought, I think it was in this chapter where he was talking about how terms have changed for things. And so what we might refer to something as might not be what it was called in the past. Having those records, but having the knowledge to understand terminology for that time is important. He talks about how not everybody during the historic time period you're studying may have been literate. So, of course, there's biases in that as well. I thought the probate stuff was really fascinating to me, the probate records, because I guess they were done at least by 
some accounts room by room. And to me, that would be so fascinating to be able to look at as an archaeologist, especially when you compare it to what you may have found in the ground at that specific site to see how they compare. Yeah, and that wouldn't necessarily even, there are things that probably wouldn't have been in that record well, that, that we would find. And yeah. I also love, did you pick up how this book got its name? No, I haven't. So he talks about it. I think it was in the first chapter. He talks about it got its name from when an appraiser wrote in a final entry from an estate auction in Small Things Forgotten, eight shillings, six pence to acknowledge things that he may have missed in the evaluation, but still had value. Cool. And that was, I think, in a record of 1658. So I just thought that was kind of a cool, cool way to find the title for your book. Yeah. yeah. Good, <laughs> good title for a book, too. Yeah. He goes on to talk about some of the differences between prehistoric and ar historic archaeology excavation methods. I think this was fine. I didn't have much to add that we haven't talked about already, unless you had something. Nope, not really. More, I think, significant right now, especially for this book, is he gets to talk about dating methods and how do we date a site. Um, we still use stratigraphy, which is basically, you know, you're probably aware of this maybe when they taught about the layers of soil and, and age of dinosaurs, for example, only we're, we're working on a much more recent scale, of course. So essentially the things below other things are usually older than the things above them. And so as you find things, you keep a record of where you find them and what depth, and that gives you an idea of what's older and what's more recent. Yeah. And I always, when I'm talking to especially young kids, I, I talk about your laundry hamper. Yeah. You know, throughout the week, the laundry on the bottom is older and older and older. <laughs> So it's very similar to how that's how stratigraphy works in most cases. He does note that carbon-14 dating is not useful for, I have in parentheses, American historic archaeology, because there certainly are some historic archaeology around the world that it could be useful for. And then he gets onto manufacturing dates. And this is where I think we start to get into the meat of this book as far as what it is. So he talks about a thing called mean ceramic dating, and this is started by an archaeologist called Stanley South, who essentially wrote a book on how we can use statistics in archaeology to give us new information. And again, the idea of an average date from your the ceramics you have from a site giving you information on when the site was lived in was very, very debatable at the time. And I'll say even now, this was an imperfect method. It has been refined. Well, and I think it's important to note too, and he does so in the book as well, that this is the manufacturing dates, right. which gives you a good idea because we usually keep things around that are, especially during that time period. And he goes in later in the book talking about the issue with getting ceramics here in the new world and all that stuff. But it's a good guideline, but there's also hand-me-downs and things like that that may have passed right. on and then and our idea of hand-me-downs is grandma gave me her wedding china, but this might be the case of we are taking hand-me-downs because we can't afford anything else. So a lot of hand-me-downs might not necessarily be high-quality stuff, but um, I think that's just an important thing to note. It is, I mean, it's a good general way to at least get an idea for a date. And then when you take that into account with all the other information you might have from the site, you can kind of narrow it down. Right. And as we stated, we talked about in, I want to say, Captain Hook or Captain Kid, uh, we don't usually just look for one date and say, that's it. You know, if we look for multiple sources to get the date, and this is just one additional tool that we have available to us now. Um, oh, and I, I wanted to add, and when things don't line up, that's almost more exciting because something is going on here that you weren't expecting and figuring out why is kind of really interesting or can be very interesting, give you some very interesting results or explanations on things. I do find that when I talk to people about archaeology and they might ask me about a specific site and it might be a site where we've just learned new information, a lot of times people start, I can see it in their face. Um, they either get really, really excited or they start to, you can tell that they're like, oh, these archaeologists don't know anything, you know, <laughs> so it kind of goes one of two ways. But I think it's really important for people to realize that archaeology is a science and it's ever changing based on the information that we find. And sometimes that information throws a wrench into what we know. And that's OK. That's actually right. good. That's what it means we're kind of work. Yeah, we're getting to the kind of meat of that 
particular subject and that's closer to the truth anyway. yeah, yeah yeah i do make a note here that he refers to the archaeologist as he which is important context of the time especially even in 1995 archaeology was still very male dominated i do know uh there are were at the time a number of really potent women archaeologists had to be to do a career in archaeology at that time there's actually a really good book we might want to check out for a future podcast called Grit Tempered. And it's specifically, I believe, either Florida or Southeastern female archaeologists and their struggles. And if you are interested in learning about that, it's a great read. And we might have to maybe do that in a future podcast. Yeah. I'm happy to say it is much less of an issue today as it was at the time, though. I'm still sure you can find some problems, but as far as like, employment goes i think the majority of archaeologists are women now yep that's the i mean i haven't looked at the statistic in maybe a year or so but i mean it was pretty close but uh women definitely were or majority he makes the claim that natural sciences aren't as useful historic archaeology as prehistory what were your thoughts on that barbara i i don't really know where he was going with that it seems like I mean, today, I don't, I would disagree with that statement. I Obviously, I wasn't around in the 70s, so I can't say why he would say that, but I was a little perplexed. Yeah. Yeah. Some of it is that we have some abilities to do things now that weren't available at the time, such That's... as microbotany, macrobotany, where they're looking at seeds under a microscope and figuring out what plants they belong to. Yeah. That kind of thing wasn't really available to him at the time. And like we think. were talking about like residue analysis on right. ceramics. And I mean, you have a talk in which you discuss pollen found right. in fecal matter. You right. know? <laughs> so Well, in plants, yeah. and plants are just as important in history. He thinks that or the cultures in historic archaeology periods were removing themselves from nature. And I don't think that holds. I, I feel I mean, when I was reading that, I thought maybe they used and utilized and existed within nature differently. Right. But I don't know you, if today it would be fair to make that statement. Yeah. yeah. I, again, I see some kind of outdated terms, uh, ideas of culture becoming more complex. We talked about that in the last book with how that's kind of not an ideal way of phrasing that anymore. Kind of out of fashion. Well, that's not, it's a lot more than out of fashion, I'd say. Uh, he talks about how things like headstones reflect dates and i have yes ah yes the headstones it's probably my strongest memory of this book is when he talks about the headstones and so i'm looking forward to that and so this part of the chapter is just kind of covering what he's going to cover in the next few chapters essentially even though this is labeled as chapter one it is really i think an introduction structured a little oddly but this is straight up the introduction i think yeah no i would agree with that oh I, you know how earlier i was talking about how when i was in school I went to a school that was mainly prehistoric archaeology at the time. <laughs> I would say, oh, I'm interested in historic archaeology. And originally I went to school because I wanted to be, do prehistoric archaeology. But then I learned about historic archaeology and I thought it was absolutely fascinating. And that's kind of where I landed. And in, the, in this book, he's talking a little bit about how at the time and even maybe somewhat now, Historic archaeology wasn't necessarily uh, accepted as such. And he says that one of the quotes got me and I kind of laughed. It's an, an expensive way to learn what we already know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no, it is not. <laughs> well, chapter two starts off talking about some of the weaknesses of archaeology as it's been done up to this point. In particular, it's very much focused on the famous person. And he makes a case that the everyday experience of your everyday person is more interesting and more valuable than the archaeology of George Washington's childhood home, for example. <laughs> I was just, um, I was in a historic community in Georgia a couple weekends ago. There were a couple plaques about George Washington, and I just kind of chuckled. And the person that was with me asked me what was so funny, and I said, Every historic community tries to tie themselves to George Washington in any way they can. And she was like, well, he was a famous person. I was like, yeah, but what about the locals? Like, right. I want to know about the people that lived here. This is why I came to this community. So I, when I was reading this chapter, it brought me back to that. <laughs> but yeah, and I mean, you and I have said that's one of the strengths 
depths of archaeology. So to think that there was a time when people were only interested in studying, you know, the the well-known historical figures, it kind of makes me sad, honestly. Right. But that's kind of a key premise of this book, I would say, is that we need to move beyond that. So he recounts a pretty remarkable excavation someone did on their ancestor's house in 1856, which is cool. I hadn't heard of this one. I hadn't either, and the whole story is so neat. I don't have a whole lot of details here, but what what stuck out to me was that he wanted to know about his ancestors, essentially, and did actually really impressive archaeology. Sounds like impressive for like, you won't see much like it for the next hundred years or so. Yeah, I mean, you and I mean, this was in what, 1856, and he took notes and maps and had datum points. Yeah, so a datum datum point is. A point of reference that won't move is kind of the idea. So you can use it to locate things in the future. And most of the time, in most sites, you have one. Right. They get two. Yeah. And nowadays, we'll often, we'll do GPS points. We'll also usually sync a piece of rebar with a plastic cap to mark as the datum. Obviously, at that time, that wasn't necessarily established they should do that or they couldn't do that with the GPS, of course. And he even cataloged artifacts. Yeah. No, it was very meticulous and sounded like he did a very good job of that excavation. And I mean, I've been researching sites that were excavated at the time this book was originally written. And I'm like, where are the notes? Where are the maps? So the fact that somebody was doing this in 1856 is really impressive because there were some archaeologists that weren't doing it in the 1960s and 70s, apparently. 80s and 90s even (laughs) sometimes. Yeah. But what was really cool is um, not much was known about this. And I guess his de- descendants later on, I believe in the 60s, 1963, I have only by chance came across his maps and documents in Mexico. In Mexico yeah. <laughs> and so I, I do wonder, though, I know he cataloged the artifacts, but I do wonder where the artifacts came up. And I think this is an important and very solid argument for a good curation and archive which facilities <laughs> wouldn't have existed at the time even like the standards for how you should do these things wouldn't have existed right at the time, oh i know so. but i'm just saying like the fact that we even know about this is pretty phenomenal pretty oh i see yeah and so when we're talking about funding collections facilities or funding archive facilities this is what happens when you don't right right <laughs> see, he does talk about how excavations to this point have closely focused on famous people like we mentioned i do want to bring this up because he specifically mentions like monticello or monticello (laughs) as you've been corrected right (laughs) right monticello is the state monticello is a city in north florida right and specifically it's monticello is the plantation home of thomas jefferson and i am sure at the time It was only about Thomas Jefferson. I will add that since then, in the last mm, decade or two, there has been a very real and fantastic effort to move beyond that and study the enslaved people in particular who were living there. And we're seeing that at a lot of plantation sites and um, other similar sites now that Mm -hmm. I think is really cool. You've even seen a lot of the plantation sites that are open to the public where they've previously just interpreted the big house, the plantation house, they're now interpreting the slave quarters and talking about the daily life of slaves. And a lot of that comes from archaeology. Yep. We even have some of that here in Tallahassee with Goodwood Plantation. Mm -hmm. They've been recently, very recently, been putting some effort into trying to expand their interpretation of their site. And so I just wanted to point that out that while he is correct that these places start off this way and they shouldn't be limiting themselves to that, many of them have at least moved beyond that and are actually doing the kind of archaeology he is trying to say is important here. He talks about Sam Smith's Tavern, and I thought that was a really good example of the strength of archaeology and understanding not only the archaeology but the history of the area. So this is a tavern that was on an island. And it really appears to be remote for such a location. Like, there, why would you have a tavern just sitting on an island? And Well, there was some debate at first whether it was a tavern or a trading post. Trading post, post. Right. yeah. And obviously the archaeology, the excavation turned up a bunch of things that you would expect to find in a tavern, as well as the size of 
the structure and everything, but it turned out there was whaling in that area. And so the whalers would have frequented this tavern, kind of keeping an eye out for whales. And so that's where that, you know, important, like you, you can use documents as well as the archaeology, as well as any local informants who may have that kind of information to kind of round out your knowledge of the area. And then he talks too, and this is where I thought it was interesting because we were talking earlier about natural sciences. The information that he gained at this site was useful to other researchers as well. And so I think it's important to note that archaeology is multidisciplinary. And right. that may not have been kind of a focus of archaeology in the 1970s. But now we realize that we rely on other people's data and other people rely on our data as well. And we work together to kind of form that historical narrative. Right. Well, for example, who identified those whale bones? Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? There's, there's experts in the natural sciences who would have done that for them. Yeah. So, and yeah. he also talks about how the information gained at this specific site uh, extended the known area for a specific architectural style at the time. That is right, yes. Yeah. So that was an example of what he termed salvage archaeology. We would typically refer to that kind of thing almost as cultural resource management or CRM today, although in this case, this was done by a park. So I think salvage archaeology probably is more accurate still. Yeah, I think, I believe, if I remember correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, that they were worried about looting at the site. Apparently they had looters out there. Yeah. yeah. Probably there was some stories of buried treasure. There always is. Always. There's never treasure, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Don't waste The your treasure time. is knowledge of our past. <laughs> so, but he, then he goes on to talk about the value of longer term studies as well. And yeah. so in this case, he starts talking about a place called Flower Do 100, Virginia. And this was inhabited for a pretty long period of time. And the records basically only tell us who owned what property when. It doesn't really go beyond that. So through archaeological investigations, they identified three distinct periods by looking at, I think, mostly the ceramics. Yeah, because he talks a lot about how um, ceramics are what we rely so heavily upon. Right. The earliest period was all about tobacco production. This was the earliest colony. And it was almost like a gold rush situation. People were going there to make their fortune and then go home to England. And so there was all the money put into their tobacco stuff. And there's not much put into like the homes and the habitation stuff. And you can see that reflected archaeology, archaeologically. Which I wasn't very familiar with that period of tobacco farming. Mm -hmm. So I found that fascinating because when you watch movies and things like that, especially during the colonial era, they always have those huge plantation houses with the big tobacco fields. And so to think that there was a time before that was something I had not learned about, I guess. The second period, uh, this is from about 1630 to 1700. England is trying to restrict how much the colonies were allowed to make themselves. So there isn't much, as I understand it, in the way of locally produced goods, which is, again, another thing you would see archaeologically represented. And the last period from about 1700 to 1750, these material culture wise, we see uh, effect from a huge influx of enslaved people. And I wasn't clear right away how you'd see that archaeologically, but he's, I think he's talking about colonial wear specifically. I know he keeps putting off the conversation about colonial wear. Right. But yeah, he does. <laughs> it kind of annoys me because I love colonial wear. Um, so colonial wear, just in case you all are not familiar, is. When a, I'm more familiar of it within the context of Spanish mission sites, but it's when a group of people kind of adopts another group of people's styles of ceramics, but they make them their own. So they may have pots and pans, for example, which they wouldn't usually have, but they make them using their traditional ceramic making techniques and things like that. So it's essentially a way in the archaeological record to identify when two cultures were kind of interacting with each other. He talks a bit about how people tended to bring culture with them when they came. So the earliest era, they were very much English or British. And as time went on around 1660, in particular, he mentions they start to diverge a bit more. And that rate of change kind of does slow down up until the Revolutionary War. But he talks about how you can see the culture divergence within just small pockets even. Apparently, very small, isolated areas tend to develop their own culture and traditions that are very unique to them. And he uses a term called 
peasant societies. <laughs> and he says this is shared amongst peasants around the world. Uh, essentially, it's defined by people who work the land, support urban centers, have conservative values, are traditional. Kinship is important. They're suspicious of outsiders, change or innovation. And life is governed by seasons. And so I, I did a little look into this. And this is not a term that's talked about today. I, when I was, I actually made a note and I, I put not a term used anymore in right. my notes. And it's not one that I've ever come across. We don't really use the word peasants anymore, even. Yeah. And really, a peasants applied to American culture is probably not easy to identify. Yeah. Because we didn't have the peasant class, I don't think. Right. Like other places did. But the idea that all peasants whirl around are the same culture is kind of weird to me, too. I thought that was strange. And I, I'm, when he was talking about it, I was like, to me, it reminded me of like folk cultures. Like, yeah, he um, talks you know, about like folk cultures the in The Appalachian yeah. Mountains and the culture that, you know, has formed there based on isolation. And I was just like, I feel like people in Appalachia would take offense if you <laughs> called them a peasant. <laughs> right. <laughs> And so I did a quick search on some journal archives, essentially, and I found that this seemed to be in use in papers from about 1950s to the 1980s. Wow, that long. Yeah. Huh. And so uh, we haven't seen it really in use. I didn't see it come up really much at all in the last 30 years, um, especially in North America. I think they look like it might be used across overseas a bit more, but I'm not sure how representative my, my investigation of that was. He does talk about pop culture versus folk culture, which is kind of what you're talking about here. Essentially, pop culture changes fast, but it's fairly uniform over a large area. And folk culture doesn't change as much and tends to be a small central area. And that makes a lot of sense to me. Remote towns tend to have their own culture, but, you know, the popular music and stuff tends to spread very quickly. And, and a lot of people know about it across large, large area. All right. And then moving on to our final chapter. I like the title for this chapter, All the Earthenware, Plain and Flowered. Just felt right to me. Um, he starts off by waxing poetical about pottery. <laughs> and uh, he says it's very important for interpretation. I think today it is still very important, but I think we have such a selection of other sources of information that it is one piece of the puzzle rather than a major piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Right. And I, he, he talks a lot about, again, chronology. And you and I know there's so much more to archaeology than just placing things in a timeline, although that's important. You have to keep in mind that archaeology is the study of the people. And so to them, the time periods don't really matter. It's what they were doing within that time period. But I do like the where he said, it may seem strange at first how much time archaeologists put in to learning and studying of ceramics. And I'm like, I remember as an undergrad, I did an internship at a lab. And the first time you walk in and there's just trays of piles and piles of ceramics. And I was just like, ooh. What have I gotten my... myself into? Yeah, is this my life now? Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, we do. But as an archaeologist, I can say there is so much more. Oh, boy. And the fights over it <sighs> I've seen over whether this is grit tempered or shell tempered or Oh, my goodness. And it's like, okay, that's cool and all, but what does that tell us about the people? Right. Yeah. I mean, like, they weigh the pottery, they measure the pottery, do all this stuff to the pottery. And I'm like, okay, but what, what does that tell us about the people? And you and I have probably been both been to conference papers where they have just tables, you know, data sets up on the screen and they're talking about, we found so many pieces of pottery that were this big and so many pieces of pottery that were this size and this color and stuff. And it's like, okay, cool. Now tell me what that means. <laughs> to some people, the data itself is interesting. Yeah. And I am not one of those people. Me neither. Me neither. I, I, I will admit I have walked out of a few of those papers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I will add that it did occur to me at this point, too, that there's a lot of talk about chronology. It's interesting because he is arguing against chronology as the only thing we want to talk about. But he still focuses on it a lot. Oh, especially in this chapter. Yeah, and that has to be a product of when he's writing it because they don't, they're trying to move past it, but they're still kind of trapped by it a little bit, it feels like. Yeah, and it, I actually have a presentation that's all on historic ceramics, and it's based off ceramics that were found at Goodwood Plantation here in Tallahassee. And when I'm giving that presentation, I purposely tried to steer clear of dates 
because number one, it's the least interesting part to me. And number two, I wanted people to have another perspective. But every time I give that presentation, every time I start talking about a different type of pottery. So when was this around? Yeah. What, you know, what does this date to? And I'm like, oh my gosh. So, yeah. <laughs> so he dives right into the ceramics and he identifies three extremely broad types, I think, in North American, uh, sorry, Northeast American historic archaeology. So there's kind of a specific to that area. But it's still a, some of the principles he's talking about still apply to practically anywhere. Um, so first we have earthenware, which absorbs water, often has lead glazes, which I think Barbara's got a story about lead glazes. I do. Can I tell it? Yes. Can I tell it? Okay. So I have backyard chickens and a lot of people like to preserve their eggs by glassing them. And it's just a method where you essentially store it in jars. And one thing I noticed as I was on these a uh, bunch of social media pages is people were starting to get these antique vessels that were possibly lead glazed and storing their eggs and other food items in their kitchen in them. And I in was like- vinegar and in, caustic Yeah, things. and caustic yeah. <laughs> chemicals. And one lady posted and she's like, yeah, there's this weird kind of leaching of substance happening from, you know, outside my jar. I don't understand what's going on. And this was a uh, earthenware kind of like crock situation. I was like, and everybody's like, oh, that's strange. Maybe it's just humidity or this, that, and the other. And I was like, or <laughs> maybe it's toxic chemicals leaching from the lead when exposed to the caustic chemicals you just poured inside it. Please, while great for decoration, Please, please, please do not store food items that you will be consuming in historic ceramics. Yeah, basically, you don't know exactly how they were produced. Yeah. And lead is probably one of the most common problematic things that were used, but there are plenty of others as yeah. well, including which one used urine? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, mocha wear. Mocha wear. Yeah. So some of your ceramics may uh, contain animal urine. Yeah, so just <laughs> keep them to look at, but don't maybe use them for food. They're very pretty as decorative pieces, right. but they should not be used for practicality. There's right. a reason we moved away from them. So earthenware started about the 1620s. It continued up into the 1700s and is basically very coarse utility stuff. It's basically just to be used, not to look pretty necessarily. The next, we start to create stoneware, which is much higher re refined, higher fired, uh, very dense. Um, they often use a salt glaze. So if you have a pot and if you hold it up to light and you see little ripples, kind of like a orange peel skin, you probably have a salt glaze on that one. It's, the, it's stoneware is interesting because it's actually still made today. You probably right. have some in your home. Yeah. Most of our ceramics today, obviously not porcelain and stuff, but a lot of our you know, everyday platters that you buy at the store are going to be stoneware. Mm -hmm. And this started in the 1670s and is continuing on. And then finally, he identifies porcelain, which porcelain is just special all around. It was at this time made in China and it is really highly refined and it is translucent. Actually, you can see through it a little bit, see light through it. But it's also not typical for an average person to see it, to have it, I think. Yeah, not this time period. Especially definitely. not these time periods. Yeah. And then he does identify a few subcategories within that. But I'll add that if you talk to someone who knows their ceramics, this would be like so overarchingly broad, broad yeah. that it would just drive them up the wall, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very good, if you're just wanting to have an idea of what type of ceramics are out there, this is a great overview. Right. That... And like I said, this is, he is talking about this to explain his ideas. He is not writing a book on ceramics for example, yeah. right? So if you want to learn ceramics, you go somewhere else. If you want to learn how to use the ceramics to, to study people in the past, this is what he's trying to communicate here. That's my take on what he's doing anyway. Yeah, it's just to kind of give you a general overview of how archaeologists can utilize ceramics. Then we go on to ceramics as a part of foodways. He defines foodways. Um, it was a term used by a folklorist, Jay Anderson, to describe and quotes the whole interrelated system of food conceptualization, procurement, distribution, preservation, preparation, 
and consumption shared by all members of a particular group. So essentially, it's how people of a group used and ate food and right. food items. Right. Perfect. <laughs> uh, so he has four factors he identifies as determining its presence in the archaeological record. So availability, need, function, and social status. And I thought these were pretty good ways of breaking this down. So the earliest settlers were extremely limited by availability. Like they, you shipping it across the ocean was costly and things would break. It was fragile. So they didn't have a lot. And I thought it was interesting. He mentions that people, I guess there were little bulletins or whatever that told people what to pack when they were getting prepared to move to the new world. And one of the things that it did not mention was plates and mm -hmm. things like that. And I think that's, at first I was reading that and I was like, that is super weird. But then when he goes on and he talks about trenchers and things like that, I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So yeah, essentially trenchers were kind of like cafeteria trays, only made of wood. Yeah. And so people, instead of using ceramics, were using wood or leather for drinking tankards or, you know, various things. And they tended to share these too. You right. didn't have your own cup and your own plate. You would t tend to sit with someone else and you'd eat out of the same thing. Yeah. So... Very different culture, essentially. Right. They're very different food ways. Right. <laughs> to use proper terminology. Right. <laughs> I thought the need was a pretty straightforward one. You know, you need mm -hmm. a cup, you need a bowl for different things. You need a cooking pot. These are all the mm -hmm. ways needs comes into play. <laughs> then we get into function. And I thought this was so Lewis Binford. Yes. So Lewis Binford <laughs> is credited with starting the the processual archaeology movement. And he was quite a personality, I understand. So Dietz actually uh, cites some work he did, and he identifies three types of function according to Lewis Binford. <sighs> These are technomic function, socio-ethnic function, and ideotechnic function. Yeah. And I just thought, how typical of the time. Yeah. You have to create a new word and just say, instead of just saying social function. Utilitarian. Utilitarian, <laughs> religious, or ideological function. You know, you yeah. have to make a whole new word for it. Well, you can't have the uh, <laughs> the, the commoners, the peasants, right. <laughs> understand what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. And so, when Barbara, again, when Barbara and I uh, harp on about how much we hated reading articles from this time, this is why. Yeah. They would always do this. Yes. We're like, you had to learn a new vocabulary word. To essentially describe something that has already been described. <laughs> right. And they would do this in every journal article we read. Yeah. Technomic and, function essentially is utilitarian. Right. Sociotechnic is just used socially. So things like a good example he had was, we don't need candles today, but we might put them out for a fancy dinner. Right. That's a social function there. Right. And then religious. The votives in a Catholic church. Right. Yeah. 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 And so you have a whole variety of different uses for these things. And then he goes on to talk about how artifacts can serve multiple functions yes. in different settings. And it's like, well, yeah, duh. <laughs> yep. Again, maybe this was more of a revolutionary idea at the time, though, because talking about the function of the artifact wasn't necessarily something they were doing as that much. That is true. That's, that's fair. That's very fair. But it also might be a dull moment. I don't know for sure. He goes on then to talk a little bit about how the food ways changed, which I thought was fascinating. Never really thought much about how the colonists ate food. But, you know, when the colonists first came over here, they were English, right? And so their English foodways kind of carried over with them. And this, like we said, they were eating from the trenchers and eating directly from cookware, like pots and pans. And ceramics tended to be more related to like dairy production. And I thought it was funny that I didn't realize cheese was such an important source of protein at the time, and they called it white meat. Yeah. <laughs> I had never heard that before, but... but... Yeah, essentially, it sounds like ceramics were only really present in the earliest times in the dairy industry. Yeah. And that's because lead-glazed ceramics were easier to clean, which I suppose that's true. It is true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Nothing like I want is cheese aged in lead. <laughs> You know, later on, as the colonies became occupied by people who were that had never seen England, right? They were born in the colonies. We end up seeing more ceramics. And this also is around the time when it was we were starting to make ceramics here rather than, a, than just importing them. 
Um, and he talks a little bit about how we don't see a lot of ceramic plates and they may have been using pewter. They may have still been occasionally eating from trenchers or wooden uh, vessels and things like that. And this was different, distinctly different from like what they were doing in England at the time. But we do see um, like drinking vessels and things like that made of ceramic. And again, looking at the probate records for the time, trenchers were still common. Mm -hmm. And he goes on to say plates were more sociotechnic at this point. Imported plates specifically too from (laughs) England or Germany. Essentially, people were kind of showcasing their perceived wealth by putting, you know, fancy plates that were imported up on the wall or in cabinets that were viewable to their guests. Right. So the plates tended to be larger. Yeah. And more decorative. I liked this too, that many of them actually show, or some of them show wear on the bottom edge. Yeah. Or they have holes where they were hung. Right. (laughs) Yeah. So that shows you pretty clearly how they were used. Right. Yeah. Sociotechnic use. Otherwise known as... They were used to establish some type of social... Social use. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) You put your fancy things on the wall so people think you're fancy. (laughs) There's also the observation that early Puritan culture may have affected how much decorative ceramics we saw at this time. So there is that indication. I thought this was interesting. The sumptuary laws were repealed in England at the time. So people in England were... were the sumptuary laws? They were um, the laws that said only certain people could wear certain fancy things. Essentially, it was is akin to a Puritan ideology and the fact that you were meant to be simple look you know, your fashion primarily like things that you couldn't couldn't wear and stuff like that in england it was more of a socio-technic law though right <laughs> right yeah it was, it was to establish who were the nobles and who exactly were not. Right. yeah like only the nobles can wear purple that kind of thing but the governor of virginia was given was told by england i guess that they were still to dress in ornate mm-hmm. so it like you said that right there is a socio-technic <laughs> way to kind of differentiate and kind of hold power over the colonies in a very strange way. Like, how would they know, (laughs) you know? If you were wearing, I guess, if you wore a silk shirt, they might know, or gold on the outside. I think those were two of the things that you weren't allowed to do. But yeah, so the Puritan ideology of the time is, like you said, reflected in the archaeology. And then the final period he identifies here, he says... Almost no imported ceramics, but then it goes on to talk about almost entirely imported ceramics. I think he means from nowhere other than England. I kind of thought that too, because he does talk a little bit about the um, like Delftware from like Germany and things. But then he goes, yeah. Mostly focuses, he says most of it is creamware from, from England. Yeah. So I think that's what he means. And then he's talking about some exceptions that we see. Right. Is my interpretation of this. And creamware was essentially the first mass production of ceramics, like Mm -hmm. the 1760s, if you care about dates. And so it was more widely available at a lower cost. Right. So that tracks, essentially. So kind of an illustration of the different use, the different, well, not always food ways, well, maybe depending on how how far (laughs) the food ways are defined, is they, he talks about a single family trash pit for a fairly short period. I think he said about 10 years. And they found a lot of plates, which was a new thing from the previous periods, but also a lot of chamber pots. Oh, I love the chamber pots. The chamber pots are kind of fun. They are so cool. Do we? I guess we should probably explain what a chamber pot is. Some people may not be familiar. Well, basically bedpans, right? Yeah. So if you think of medical bedpans, essentially that's what that is. Right. They had outhouses at the time. Right. You didn't want to have to get up out of bed and go out of your house, walk across the Especially yard the blizzard or the rain or yeah the, and then go use yeah. the outhouse so yes they had essentially bed pans that they would keep in their chambers and their bedrooms for that purpose but they i just the humor and mm-hmm. stuff that he talks about some of them had faces in them some of them had the king's initials which for the colonies uh-huh. i think is great yeah and some of them had like little limericks almost limericks yeah and he says one of the more charming verses appears on certain pearlware chamber pots lettered inside on the bottom. Treat me nice and keep me clean and I'll not tell what I have seen. <laughs> <laughs> and so he interprets 
this move towards more plates and more chamber pots as a move from a shared material culture to more individual. He says this would certainly be an expression of newly emergent worldview characterized by order, control, and balance, which I thought that was probably an overreach. But yeah, that the whole balance thing <laughs> kind of... Uh, I the, had a hard time kind of just going with that one. Right, but so. going from a shared material culture to having your own thing, own plate, own cup, that I felt was pretty I can I can go along with that, right. yes. Um, and then we get to the infamous porcelain's comment. So in the 1780s, he says they start to see some porcelain in, particularly in tea sets. So this is an indication that the British tea culture was making its way to the Americas. Yeah, which adoption of the English tea ceremony. And I was, are you familiar at all with like the re-anglicization process? This is something I had not heard much of, but he talks about how this, during this time period, the colonies were starting to be more anglicized. I, I think what I was understanding was that there was a period where British culture was becoming popular again. Okay. It was probably very unpopular during the Revolutionary War, for example. Right. And I was just trying to, I was like, wow, that's just kind of strange to me because in the 1780s, that's... That seems pretty recent. Yeah. yeah. Like we just declare our independence and then we're like, oh, all right, let's go have an English tea ceremony. Yeah. That's very interesting they to miss me. Miss tea that badly, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> we see this later on, too, with like the Victorian era, especially in like architecture and such. Yeah. And so, I guess even today, there's a lot of comes in Anglophiles. Right. So. Yeah. If the Beatles are popular right now, you know, that kind of thing might affect how much of that goes on for a while. The argument about his observation on porcelain being rare before the 1800s, that aside... This part confused me a little bit. He basically says this was a socio-technic, so a social purpose for having these uh, things. Then they says that they might be less likely to enter the archaeological record because they're infrequent and careful use, which makes sense to me. Then he says the best explanation for this early date for the porcelain was that it had been treated with greater care. That doesn't... How... If it's less likely to enter the historic record because it's carefully used why does this careful use mean it's more likely to be in the historic record did you pick up on that no but i am rereading this as you talk about it and ugh, that is confusing that almost has to be a edit i feel issue. like maybe what he's trying to say is because it was so cared for it, it you know maybe almost like the hand-me-down discussion it doesn't belong there but it's there because it didn't break until later. You know what I'm saying? So he's saying that maybe it was imported at an earlier time and it didn't break until this point? That's what I I'm suppose thinking. that could be. But he doesn't really say that very clearly. Right. So a bit of a mystery, but an interesting idea potentially for why there's that skew in when porcelain is in the record or how much. It's also important to point out that if it's that rare and that carefully used, then it probably isn't in the record to the same rate that it would have existed. Right, yeah. I mean, we even, even today, porcelain is a collectible and, you know, people... Pretty high value still. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then he finishes up this chapter by talking about locally produced pottery, although I feel like this is almost a discussion intended to be picked up later. I think so. Okay. That's kind it's very of quick. what I... Like, I didn't take many notes on this because it does seem like he's setting up for some future discussion, especially about Kelowna wear right. and stuff. But not the next chapter, of course. But not the next chapter, right? <laughs> so we'll just kind of leave that, I guess. All right, so that wraps up the first three chapters of In Small Things Forgotten. What did you think of the book so far, Barbara? I really have enjoyed it. There's a lot of reminiscing that has occurred as I'm reading this. It is, like I said, very different to read it as someone who now has a lot of field experience and practical experience in archaeology, as well as someone who talks to the public. And I, especially when it comes to like the chronology stuff, you know. There are some things in here I wouldn't necessarily include in a public. Like he gets into the numbers a little bit. Not bad, but definitely more than I normally would. Yeah, and the dates. Yeah. Like, dates are cool, and maybe, like, a general chronology like this came before that. Mm -hmm. But um, you don't have to know specifically that this, you know, in 1760, creamware became mass-produced. Right. You know, stuff like that. Like, all you have to know is it became mass-produced, and this is what occurred 
as a result of that. But archaeologists tend to love the dates. It's interesting because I feel like there's almost like different types of archaeologists as well. As far as like personality goes, right? Sure. You and I are both the type that don't really care too much about the dates. We're not, we're the two people that walk out of a presentation. If we go and we see just tables and tables of data on the PowerPoint presentation. I want cause and effect. Give me what we learned and show me that you had something that comes from, but I don't need all the details. Right. But I need to respect the fact that there are people that love that stuff. And I'm glad there are. And there's a place for those people. Right. I, <laughs> <laughs> well, the implication would be someplace very hot, but the way you phrase that, but I don't think it's what you meant. No, the, you know. <laughs> but yes, I'm glad that there are people who get into that kind of thing. I'm glad there are people who can make a whole career out of identifying one centimeter wide stone chips and cataloging yeah. those because I couldn't do that. I am glad somebody else made a chronology of Spanish olive jars yes. because now I don't have to. Right. <laughs> so yeah, I, I also really enjoyed this for a lot of the same reasons as you did. Looking at it from a more historical context too, especially like, you know, things have developed a lot in the last 20 years and look at how much this is kind of out of date, but not ridiculously out of date. Like there's nothing overtly offensive and stuff in this. It just is a little, you can, it's showing its age a bit, but it's, it's really good. I also remember it being very accessible, but I forgot how much I enjoyed reading it. He has a very good writing style. Really it's kind does. of whimsical almost. Like he has a certain. It's cozy. Yeah. Yeah. Cozy it is the perfect way to describe it. Makes me think it. of if anyone's actually title might imply it too, uh, that James Harriet, All Creatures Great and Small. Yes. He kind of has a very cozy style of writing too. Makes me think of that a bit too. And maybe that is, I wonder if that has something to do with the title as well, but who maybe. knows? Maybe. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's been pouring down rain here in Florida for what seems like the last eternity. And this has just been a fun book to pour a cup of tea and cozy up on the couch with my dogs and read. It's it's enjoyable. Yeah. And even if you aren't an archaeologist, I think you will really enjoy it, especially if you have any interest in history at all. I think the fact that he focuses on the, uh, you know, colonial era and, you know, the northeastern part of our country kind of helps people make it accessible because that's a like if we if you were to focus on something else that may not be as familiar to people, I don't know if this book would have the same impact. Well, and as he says himself, too, there is value in limiting for himself how much he includes. Yeah. Because if he had tried to do even just the whole United States. Yeah. He couldn't have really demonstrated these ideas near as well. And I would prefer that an author write about what they specialize in than trying to write about something that they may not know as much about. Because number one, there's a lot of mistakes that can happen in that. And number two, their passion won't kind of show through that. And I feel like you get a lot of his excitement and passion about that area of the country in his writing. And that's probably what makes it so cozy. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Passion is definitely enthusiasm comes through in the book about this too. Yeah. And about the ideas again. All right. So for the next three chapters, we kick off in the chapter that honestly, I remember the most clearly out of this whole book. And we start off with headstones and he talks about headstones and how the design changes over the time. It's it's a good chapter. And headstones are cool. They and you are. will uh, cemeteries are probably one of my favorite things to talk about. And so I'm really excited about talking about that chapter because it's a passion of mine. So yeah. my enthusiasm will show through. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. So that wraps us up for today. Thank you all for listening once again. And we'll be reading the next three chapters if you want to follow along. Barbara said she found this as a hard copy only, but it wasn't necessarily expensive. No, I think I paid like $16 for it. So not so. too bad for this. Definitely cheaper than Captain Kit. Kit. Yes. Then we'll see you next time. All right. Happy reading, everyone. Archaeology Books for Fun is brought to you by the Florida Public Archaeology Network, a program of the University of West Florida. You can find out more about archaeology and about FPAN at fpan.us. We appreciate any feedback, so if you're listening to us as a podcast, please leave us a review. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Thanks for listening. Thank you.